Welcome, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this month's State of Freight webinar. My name is Marianne Hinsley. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Sonar, and I'll be your host for today. As always, I'm happy to be joined by our founder and CEO, Craig Fuller, and Head of Freight Market Intelligence, Zach Strickland. Today's conversation will cover the latest insights from our Sonar platform, current supply and demand trends, and a general outlook for capacity expectations as we enter the spring months. Craig and Zach will also be answering your questions live following our discussion. And before we get started, just a couple of quick items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, you can reach out to our team via the audience chat function in your webinar console. And if you have questions that you would like to ask Craig and Zach, you can enter those through the Q&A box in your console at any any point during our conversation today, and we'll answer as many of those as we have time for during the live Q&A. At this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Zach to kick off today's discussion. All right, thank you, Marianne, and thank everybody here today for tuning in. Uh, if you have one eye on the March Madness stuff going on too, thank you. Uh, but Craig, it is March. It is March. It is March, and March is traditionally Kind of a transition month, not just for weather, but for freight as well. Uh, I think typically we do see some volumes kind of start cranking up a little bit, but nothing that's terribly dramatic in, in a lot of cases. But it does signify kind of a turning of that doldrum of the winter yep. into something a little bit more active. People start waking up a little bit earlier and, uh, and starting to pick things back up. Well, there's a lot of products yeah. that are now... Mm -hmm. You know, start. We'll start to move. Mm -hmm. uh, that really, the spring season kicks off. We have things like construction starts to pick up. Yep. Weather's typically better, so crews are out ready to to do work. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, a lot of yard uh, stuff. The, the big box retailers do really well this time of year because yep. of gardening and yard work yep. that people have need to to, to do. Um, and you just have normal sort of summer apparel that's also important. Now let's not forget beverages. Yep. Not this time of year. Beverages aren't hot demand, but we get to Memorial Day, beverages will heat up and Beverage we have season. produce season. Yeah. So like, this is this is always a good time in freight mm -hmm. because it is it's sort of the the spring season. Yeah. Other than allergies, I love spring. <laughs> it's the only thing I don't love about spring. So. Yeah, I, I love spring too uh, because it warms up and everybody starts getting out, more activity, et cetera. I know we have a large part of our audience that they're, they're not familiar with some of these seasonal patterns. I know a lot of these long-term operators are like, Duh, you of know, course. yeah, you know, but there's still a lot of people out there that don't know that March is where home and garden supply really tends yep. to explode early. And then, yeah, people you know, say, Hey, I'm not, how can that be? Yeah. You know, I'm not doing my garden, I'm yeah. gonna wait until really Memorial Day. But yeah. you remember, in a supply chain, those products mm -hmm. come in, they have to get into distribution centers and they have to get into ultimately retail. Mm -hmm. And the retailers will start yep. stocking these items. And, and really, what you'll see is right after Easter, a lot mm -hmm. of the when gardening season sort of mm -hmm. starts and picks up. Yeah. It's always fun to walk through a grocery store or Walmart or a Target right after a big holiday. Mm -hmm. And I remember going right after Halloween uh, this past year and seeing Christmas stuff out yeah. there and just being like, wait a second. Yeah, like, exactly. They waste no time <laughs> as part of the process. Uh, this year, Easter, you know, they were selling Easter candy as early as January. That seemed premature, but you know, the retailers need some reason to sort of keep pushing product. And that frankly drives a lot of freight demand. Yeah, and they can't miss demand. Like there that is would a be, finite yeah. window mm -hmm. uh, that of which you have to hit mm -hmm. and you maximize as many of your sales right. for whatever that product is. So Cadbury eggs are obviously pretty important right now. One of my favorite <laughs> Easter candies. Easter so is earlier this year <laughs> yep. than typical. So they even have a finer sort of a tighter time frame to sort of to push it out. It's funny how that works. Well, I, I think when we talked last in February, of course, the market was kind of coming out of this weird winter high in terms of, you know, perceived tightness. We saw tender rejection index. Well, I think last time we talked, it was up. a little, it was like, it was just sort of a yeah, flat volume. Down. Let's go ahead and pull it up. O -O try. This is kind of the way that I, this is like my go-to index right now for knowing what's going on with freight. I think it's going to be the fastest one too when we see the next, transitory space. I think we've been talking about, and a lot of the questions I get asked uh, are, when is the market going to flip? And Everyone I, wants to know. I, We're I asking the same questions yeah, internally. We don't know. But this index, I feel like, is going to be the one that shells us fastest. Uh, I think the winter weather stuff, you know, we've kind of smoothed out of that, but we've kind of fallen back into this 3.8% range. Now, it is higher than it was last year, but only barely, marginally. Barely. I think the question is going to be, 
If I'm running a supply chain, can we pull nope. back? Can we pull that? Oh, it's on this screen. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's you doing that, right? I sat on it. Okay. <laughs> there you go. But if, if we look right here at this chart and you look at where uh, it was last year, there's a tiny gap between the two data mm -hmm. points. I think the question that I would be asking is, do we think it's going to trend like last year, which was a, sort of an anomaly? Mm -hmm. uh, typically, May is it starts to pick up. Or is it going to trend, uh, you know, are we going to see it actually pick up? Yeah. So I think it's going to be more of a normal year. I think we're going to see, there's a lot of reasons to be bullish in the second half of the year. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to look more like a typical May sort of Q2 than what, what it was last year. Like, like last year's data is pretty unusual. And unfortunately, we got to go back to 2019 to get into it. Yeah, and I, I quit putting the 2019 on here because I didn't want to live too far in the... I mean, that's five years ago. It's crazy. <laughs> it's yeah. Can you... That world like, is gone. <laughs> but it's so weird because yeah. it doesn't feel like it's been that long. Right. No, I, it's the the time compression is real at our age for sure. But I think it's <laughs> it's the COVID side. COVID for sure. COVID really screwed that. Altered that a little bit. But yeah, I do feel like, you know, we knew that this was going to happen to an extent. We still have an oversupply situation, you know, yeah. in the market. It's yeah. still. I think people have underestimated just how oversupplied the market. I was. think at first they did. Yeah. I think if you look at some of the dialogue recently, mm -hmm. even if you go back to two years ago or, or eighteen months ago. Uh, where a lot of the folks that were out challenging some of our thesis about the softness of the market mm -hmm. didn't believe that the market had added so much capacity and they were taking exception. I think you had actually said that we added something like 27 or 28% capacity. Oh, it was nuts. And there were people who got really angry with you over that. Yeah. They're now saying, hey, there's too much capacity. Because I think what's happened is that all of the sort of, the realities have set in. Mm -hmm. The market is incredibly soft. And I think everyone's trying to understand why is the market softness, mm -hmm. not a, you know, the volumes actually look pretty, pretty good. Like not massively robust, but not bad. So the question becomes that I think everyone's sort of caught up to where we were yeah. 18 months ago. Yeah. It's not a, I think also we, uh, from an industry perspective, we've gotten used to looking at kind of demand side indicators purely. Like there's been very few indicators of capacities growth. You know, we have net revocations yep. and things like that, that people have looked at, but that's not, that doesn't really paint a very complete picture. It's hard. It's uh, that data is hard to understand yeah. to, to like back it in because it's it's carriers, not mm -hmm. at truck counts. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to sort of articulate right about the sort of build. Um, but you almost have to do that because the the GDP data and the freight volume data is actually pretty robust, mm -hmm. and this does explain it away. And I think that's what I think that's what we've seen is. Mm -hmm. We've seen cycles early on where the government data, the, the GDP data was pretty strong, mm -hmm. but the freight market hadn't fully collapsed. It's yeah. collapsed, and if the GDP data is still strong, mm -hmm. how do you explain the softness? Well, obviously capacity. So I think that's where everyone's coming around to where, where you're at. Yeah, I, I where think. Where have you been? Yeah, I think finally. Uh, I want to pull up the OTVI chart real quick because demand is – obviously part of the supply demand equation. I think tender rejection rates are kind of the re end result, the way I think about it, in terms of supply demand curve intersections. When the moment, it's really the truth. Yeah, and, and, and so that one helps me understand the capacity situation, but demand can't be ignored because GDP, we talked about it last year. Nobody was expecting a 5% GDP figure. Look, I, we, got, yeah. we got it wrong about GDP. I mm -hmm. think I certainly did, thought that the second half was gonna be a lot Tougher. Uh, we thought that the student loan yeah. deferments were going to, you know, ending the deferment program was going to was going to hurt things. There's just a lot of sort of credit issues in in the market. Mm -hmm. You know, the bank failures certainly caught everyone off guard early on, and people thought it would really reverberate for the economy. None of that happened. No. Frankly, the economy kept on. Look at the baby blue doing there. Well, the baby blue uh, North Carolina Tar Heel blue there in the 2023 market, up and to the right nearly from January on. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's basically like you're right. I mean, if you go back to last year, it was actually a pretty good year. Yep. We talked about that. Um, and you look at this year, we're, you know, we're up 6 7% year over year. That's pretty strong. It's really now, it doesn't good. feel that way. If this had happened prior to COVID, before this, I, I've told people this, a 5% increase in OTVI in the, before 2020 would have been 2018. <laughs> 2017, been, 2018. The problem is you still have so much excess capacity yeah. and you still have to get rid of it. So 
Um, you know, that's going to be interesting to watch to see whether OTVI continues to, even if it stays at these levels, we're still churning through a lot of capacity and that's going to come out of the market. Do you have any concerns here, though? Like we were talking about, you know, we kind of look at things very quickly. And I mm -hmm. think that's what makes us, because I was thinking the same thing you did last, you know, third, fourth quarter last year, consumer demand should trail off because they're building credit card debt, all these sort of things. Do you still have any of those concerns? I mean, look, I think what is not sort of as understood or harder to understand and track is the government stimulus, not to consumer wallets, mm -hmm. but in infrastructure and, you know, the Build Back Better programs, the Inflation Reduction Act, mm -hmm. CHIPS Act, those things had the infrastructure bill, those things put a significant amount of government dollars into the economy. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened is where we saw softness in other parts of the freight economy, mm -hmm. um, those things tend to sort of override. And that's what kept mm -hmm. the economy coming. When all of the other data points suggested the economy was going to roll over, it didn't. Right. And I think the question is why. And I think it's largely because of these government bills were so massive. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars went into the economy. And I think that is what has kept the economy really in a, a pretty good position relative to what you would otherwise expect. If you yeah. sort of took a traditional, um, you know, a free market sort of look at it, you would say that when you have credit tightness, mm -hmm. when you have, um, you know, the student loan deferment roll off, you have just consumers getting tired. You have all these factors that are sort of playing out. You would normally assume that the, the economy would roll over. Uh, and, and you had bank failures, too, that created a credit crunch. But let's not forget that the Federal Reserve basically put an unlimited backstop on banks to avoid a financial right. crisis. And I think what we have now is, a, is an economy that in many ways is capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Like... <laughs> Like, I think if we've learned anything from China is that you can, in many ways, you can support your economy mm -hmm. through significant fiscal and monetary spending right. to keep it from rolling over. I'm not suggesting that's the right <laughs> policy. At some point, you got to pay the, right. the price. But, but that is effectively what our government is doing, is like they're propping up parts of the economy and mm -hmm. keeping, that, keeping that machine going. They're piling up trillions of dollars of debt in the process, which is a different story, which we're not here to talk about. Right. But it, it's effectively what's happening is that the, the government, not in the form of consumer stimulus, and I think this is the thing that a lot of people have missed is we, everyone understood when the triple P payments were coming out, because as a small business owner, you either, you know small business owners in your community, mm -hmm. uh, most people do, uh, and consumers are receiving checks. If you feel that stuff immediate, and that's pretty obvious, it's top of mind. Right. I think what's happened in the last year is a lot of that money has still entered the economy, mm -hmm. but it's not going in the hands of consumers. It's right. going in the hand, hands of state governments. It's going in the hands of, of contractors that are, are spending this money. And it's, it's a bit quieter mm -hmm. spending. Sure. You know, it's a little like these businesses are not talking a lot about right. how much money they're getting from federal, the federal government. Sure. <laughs> So you think that's probably kind of trickling down a little I think bit? That's, and, that's propping up a lot of the yeah. economy. And I go back, it, it was eye-opening. Went to a Volkswagen, the CEO of Volkswagen mm -hmm. gave a presentation here in town. They've got a big plant. Yep. Bunch of CEOs in the room. And he, he said, look, like, whether you want an electric vehicle or not, you're going to get one because there's $8 billion of stimulus, $8 billion of incentives per mm -hmm. manufacturer, per, I think it's per year. It was astounding that it was available to them but they had no choice but to build electric vehicles. It was that's like, insane. we're going to build electric vehicles whether you want them or not. And I think when you, when you hear that, you know that that's, this, the government is pumping trillions of dollars and keeping a lot of things alive. And, and, and traditionally, this type of technological jump creates a pretty booming economy. Uh, when, when we'd have these things kind of happen, like the PC back in the 90s created a huge economic, uh, a bubble it, yeah. eventually, but... It, you know, these type of technological leaps tend to really stimulate the economy and the EV and we, we're, you know, nearshoring in Mexico are becoming right. more of a thing. And there's a lot of automotive manufacturing. I don't, know that, there. I don't know that EV, you could argue that it's, it's actually improving productivity of the economy. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's a new thing. 
<laughs> well, look, the amount of money that we that the federal government has, take the consumer stimulus out of the conversation, but the amount of money that the government has spent on infrastructure and on trying to pick winners mm -hmm. in terms of manufacturing could be compared to the Cold War. The space race, uh, when the, the Department of Defense mm -hmm. and the military industrial complex were trying to win the space race and win and beat the Soviets, they spent billions of dollars on these massive projects, whether we're talking the interstate highway system or we're talking the, uh, you know, a lot of the R&D in terms of aircraft and space, mm -hmm. all of that, that put a lot of money into the economy. Right but for the use case of trying to beat the Soviets. Now, consumers and businesses benefited from it, and I think that will play out here as well. Okay. I mean, the internet was born out of those days. Right. GPS <laughs> was born out of those days. Right. So like, there is a lot of sort of benefit. I don't think that's been necessarily the directive. I think the government has wanted to basically make the, put the United States in a position where at least this is the public policy mm -hmm. where we can beat the Chinese in terms of electric vehicles, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, semiconductor manufacturing and so forth. A little bit more protectionist. It's all protect. Yeah. It's largely protectionist. Yeah. You know, whether you agree, whether you're on the aisle, largely is protectionist. Well, both, both of parties our are protectionist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's inevitable that in the next cycle, you're mm -hmm. going to have a protectionist president. We just don't know. Which one? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> so one maybe a little bit more than the other. We'll find out. Uh, so I want to go back to the freight market uh, for a second here and look at the net changes in truckload authorities because this is, I think, this chart is the one that I'm I end up talking about the most recently because everybody's like, we already said it. When is the market going to flip? Um, and it's a supply side question. And it's not necessarily as much of a demand side question because we just talked about it. Demand is pretty strong. Looks like it's going to be relatively flat or mm -hmm. slightly up maybe for the rest of the year. In our point of view, as of today, <laughs> things can change, obviously. Uh, but this chart here, the net changes in trucking authorities. It has been in the red all of 2023. It looks like we're kind of pulling up. Now, I want to say that this index, this chart, these figures bias high. So just because it goes green doesn't mean that capacity is growing. Yep. We have had what I would consider a little bit of a directional shift coming into March. The last three weeks, we've actually netted uh, some new authorities. And I did do a little bit of looking into the background. And some of that, we have seen a little bit of a shift away from the general commodity entrance. Like I'm, I'm talking about 5 to 10% maybe tops uh, into the other kind of modes, like we can see somewhat- Oil and gas, like flatbed, things like that. Bulk, flatbed, uh, both on there in a little bit more significant fashion over the last couple of months, as well as refrigerated. Yep. Um, do you, I mean, it's still netting. I mean, it doesn't mean that just because you're, you can you haul a tank behind you, you can't go and get a dry van trailer. Do you think that, that this has you concerned in any way that the we might extend this cycle out? Look, I think just looking at the two mountains, if you will, mm -hmm. like the, the green mountain and the red mountain, yeah. call it that. <laughs> red um, it's still, like you put those together mm -hmm. and you still have an excess. Yeah. I, I think it's still going to churn. We'll still see a lot of churn. It doesn't give me any pause. It, it, mm -hmm. At some point, as it inevitably does, when you have soft conditions, when tender rejections are low and spot rates are not accelerating, it's you're going to continue to see churn. I think the question is how much longer is yeah. churn going to exist? Um, and, and I think fundamentally this cycle, and, and one thing to keep in mind is we've heard anecdotal conversations about some of the larger fleets parking trucks. Like, it's not only are they not um, able to sort of maximize their business, but they have trucks parked against the fence that they don't even want to hire a driver for because they want to wait until the market right. improves to sort of put those trucks mm -hmm. into play. Those will incrementally come back into the market and it will think. I think it's going to be a pretty, like, I, I still believe that the second half is going to be sort of the turning of the market. But I, I don't think it's going to be a straight up. I think it's going to look a lot more like 2009 to 2012. And oh, okay. I know we've talked about this. Sort of my current thesis is that it's going to take a while before it's not going to be a massive capacity crunch. Mm -hmm. It's going to be pockets of issues. 
Yeah, uh, I, I tend to agree with that in general, but I do think that the concern, just because of the nature of the sheer speed of this, uh, the supply side directionality tends to be harder to shift. The market flips and so capacity can fall right through it at times. Although this does give me pause with that thesis in terms of saying, look, supply may actually be slow. I mean, a little bit more responsive than I thought it might be. I mean, oil and gas is a good, yeah. I mean, the oil and gas sector is doing really strong. Oh, yeah. And and that stuff is driving mm -hmm. some new exploration and some right. new trucking services. All fair, all fair points. So I want to talk about rates. <laughs> Rates uh, themselves. So your favorite chart, and I, I cleaned it up for Thank you. Thank you this for time. bringing my favorite. I just I had to clean it up for you. Can we this, show it on screen? On yeah. This screen. this this is the index that measures the variance between. It's the spread. It's the, it's the spread, spread between contract and spot rates. So it's spot less contract. Uh, spot, of course, being the more volatile, the near term rate you get for a day or two, a week maybe, uh, and the contract rates being more of those rates that are dedicated for about 12 month cycles. Contract tends to operate a level above spot in general. So most of the time, like you see this index in red, that's where contract is above spot. In green, that is where spot is above contract. That is very hard to do in general outside of these little pockets. You know, not, it's not a very sustainable world. Uh, but we were seeing, we're, we have been seeing, and we still see a little bit of this, this trend line of where this spread, which has been historically wide, uh, starting to shrink a little bit. Starting to shrink. It's you know it's interesting how it's gotten beat back down in March. Yeah. Really, that February to March time frame where it was making a rally to that fifty yeah. cent um, delta. Yeah. Negative fifty cents. It's now sort of beat back down. Right. Um, but yes, that's a you know I think that that number you see right there will I think be the low of this year. Really. I think it will. Con I think it will creep back up, hmm. um, and there and really, there's a lot of reasons for that. One okay. is we're moving into a, a better time in freight. The freight calendar does see increases. Mm -hmm. That's inevitable. I still believe that capacity is bleeding off. I'm not mm -hmm. buying the thesis that uh, there's been a lot of new and net additions into the market. Um, I think capacity is bleeding off, and I, I think fundamentally, um, spot rates will. You know, contract rates will compress the new bids coming in. Mm -hmm. Spot rates will continue to be a little bit under pressure as mm -hmm. we sort of end up in a heavier shipping season. And so I would expect that to think. One thing we talked about last time mm -hmm. was that a lot of the sort of volume in the market was actually on those long haul lanes yeah. that entered intermodal, sort mm -hmm. of the intermodal friendly lanes of these port long haul situations is as we move into the rest of the calendar in the freight shipping cycle, you actually end up in different parts of the freight market, mm -hmm. like start to take hold, where right. the spread between contract and spot is actually more narrow. And so I think um, as a concentration issue, uh, shortly the halls will play out. Yeah, I mean, this time of year, we tend to transition into, like the summer months tend to be a little bit shorter length of haul dominant, mm -hmm. uh, just because you get some distribution. Yep. You know, like we get replenishment in the winter and then third quarter, into early fourth quarter, then we get that distribution channel in the summer months and then around the holidays. Yep. Uh, so that being also said, the long hauls kept the spot rates lower. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The concentration mixing. and when you start having those regional lanes, the price per mile goes up. Doesn't it's a, it's a mixed problem yeah. more than anything. But is it? I mean, the the spread here. Like I feel like we've been in this space so long where the the spot market has been such a desperate wild wild west environment of like let me just get what I can get. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this has the chance to kind of shoot up quickly over the next few months? Because yeah, it is I, I don't know if it, quickly is the right term. I, again, I think it's going to be a, a gradual, yeah. like everything's relative, right? Yeah. It's not, I don't think it's going to get in positive territory. That's what you're asking. But I think I think it could, the 50 cent a mile, we're at what, 74 cents right now? Yeah. Um, I think it, it should make that back by the end of April. Okay. I, would, I would expect to get back to sort well, of- Well, we are seeing a little bit of increase uh, on the spot market as of today. I know it's been- or I, Look, I think I would look to how post-Easter, let's get through the Easter season. Let's move into April. I think we'll start to see some, some increasing demand. Uh, I think we'll see some better conditions in terms of projections that we've seen. So uh, that's what I would expect. Yeah, and we've got the NTIL, of course, that excludes uh, fuel costs um, that has been creeping up 
in March. Like we kind of hit this floor, and I, I think my thesis last. But there's a lot of seasonality too. Yeah, obviously. Right. But I mean, at the end of February, it kind of floored out, and I was thinking that we had some emotion in the market. Yeah. I thought that it was driving the rates down too fast because this everybody. Is depressed. It's winter, man. <laughs> everybody was getting so desperate. It kind of drove it down. I think you're. You said something about mixing last month as well, that I think obviously was was part of this too. But we're starting to see a little bit of a a perk. It's perking up. Spring flowers, man. <laughs> well, those, spring. those have it around Mother's Day, traditionally. We get well, some May. Get, I don't know. You go to my yard. I got I got green grass all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Warmer. Uh, I mean, that's I've got some, there's some blooms of some, some of the trees and stuff. Oh, it warmed up. I think across the northern tier, it warmed up fast, as fast as it ever has. Yeah. They've actually had blooms. So I, I think yeah. that encourages, mm-hmm. you know, that does, in all seriousness, that does drive some retail. Oh, retail yeah. has a high correlation to temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, so the weather actually has a pretty significant impact on, on consumer sentiment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think as, as things warm up, as the weather tends to get better, I think it, it should drive some of the retail sales. And I think we'll start to see the fact that it's sooner mm-hmm. is, uh, is better for retailers. Yeah. I mean, do you think that this is going to be kind of one of those springs that are, that are relatively strong? Typically, we see kind of a push at the end of March. It's the end of a quarter. Mm-hmm. It's warmer. It's the first time it warms up in Chicago. So everybody comes out It'd of the It'd be house. stronger than it was last year. Yeah. I don't know that I would call it a strong okay. March. I actually think a lot of the public companies will probably talk about a pretty abysmal Q1. Yeah. You know, they're going to all take as much write-offs as they can get away with. Sure. They're going to say how bad the quarter was because there's no one's going to ping them. Um, and then they're going to start looking forward to the second half. I think we'll hear some conversations about the second half being better. Yeah, one of the uh, so I want to break down the tender rejection index a little bit here because this this to me tells me a lot about how we can have some breakout in the industry, mm-hmm. and you know it's not all about dry van as much as it dominates the space. Uh, but the tender rejection index we break into van, refrigerated, and flat, um, and flatbed rejection rates um, really showing off. That's all that that's <laughs> the infrastructure mm-hmm. that's oil and gas just to your point <laughs> a lot of that is happening i think uh, i think that's a, a lot of what you're seeing right there is tightness and supply mm-hmm. combined with and look obviously housing you know this is the start of the housing construction season mm-hmm. and things like that is also played out but i think what's kept the flatbed market relatively okay mm-hmm. has been lar- largely related to some of the non-housing or non-consumer parts of the economy yeah um, the refrigerated figure on here too. I mean, I kind of think we all expect flatbed to have a moment here in March, April. Uh, that is pretty high though, uh, in terms of overall, but it, it is a lower density figure uh, to keep in mind in terms of the overall index. But refrigerated, you know, I think people start talking about produce, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like you've already mentioned. Refrigerated really looks like it had, it actually may have lost a little bit of steam because of the, kind of a short and protect from freeze season. Yeah, it's exactly what's happening yeah. there. And look, refrigerated is a fungible commodity. Mm-hmm. Not, you, you can go one direction, yeah. right? Like <laughs> refrigerated trailers can go in the van market and so forth. Yeah. But it's all largely in the refrigerated market is driven by contract mm-hmm. rate, which tends to be more steady mm-hmm. and um, food product and wet yep. temperature controlled. And so essentially what you're seeing there is pretty mild temperatures at the end of February. Kept yeah, those rates pretty really, really warm. No signs, no signs of any dramatic produce. I think I looked at some of the produce rates uh, just this last week. Florida is the only one. Mm-hmm. You've got strawberries coming out right now. Um, and how, how is the sentiment among ag this year? Like California's <laughs> flooding can't help. It's so produce. We talked about this a little bit. It's such a wild ride in terms of watching it because the yield actually may like a smaller yield may actually be a more uh, profitable for a transportation service provider. Short, ter- short, shorter, shorter, shorter season. Window. Yeah, shorter windows. So that means that everybody going to Costco, Walmart, and you know, getting that first produce, uh, they're going to have a heightened sense of urgency on a rate basis. But yes. volume matters. Okay. And so, what is your sentiment on this produce season? So I don't think it's going to be the. It doesn't look like it's going to be the robust breakout moment that we saw in 2017, mm-hmm. uh, just because we're still so oversupplied. I mean- In capacity or fruit? Capacity. Okay. And I mean, produce is a niche. And what drives that is the price. <laughs> so when the price of the produce hauling goes through the roof, 
especially in a market like this, you don't need a lot. <laughs> yep. um, everybody runs out west, yeah. or you know that's the next you know after Florida. How much of the produce has to be refrigerated, by the way? Uh, not all of it. Depends on the weather. So Kent Baker, actually, he's he works at Freight Weeds. We had a webinar the other day. He has he spent a large portion of his time hauling produce, and they wake up every day looking at the weather. <laughs> Because if the weather is wet, warm, cold, you can put that produce on a dry van. Mm. <laughs> and so if the weather is relatively stable out west, and maybe it's cooler uh, for the mm -hmm. spring, you can haul that stuff across the country, especially if we're temperate. Got it. Um, but most of the time, you do need some level of refrigeration. Uh, and the spring rains, definitely still something to watch. Mm -hmm. We kind of already think the season's been pushed a little bit further out, which is exactly what happened in 2017. So if that occurs prior to, like if we get to a point where capacity equilibrium is tighter and the produce runs happen, that could be the first canary in the coal mine for the market, mm. which is exactly what happened in 2017. Now we had Harvey, ELD, and some economic stimulus, <laughs> yep. all kind of contributing to that market. But this one, I'm gonna be watching Rotri probably over the next three months to see if there's any significant moves there. Nothing yet so far. I wouldn't expect it in March, not in California. It's the next one. The last produce coming out of Yuma, the lettuce and cruciferous are moving right now. No issues there. So that's just telling me that this market is still very well supplied right. yeah. and we're not seeing a, any reason to really think this is gonna be like an explosive environment just yet. So I got a question. Mm -hmm. So Donald Trump has said that he's going to inflict significant tariffs on China if he mm -hmm. wins the election. We, you talked about what happened in 2017, mm -hmm. briefly, about the fact that there was a lot of sort of folks trying to free run, bring a lot of products mm -hmm. in to avoid those tariffs. Do we think that shippers are going to do the same thing this year? Is in the anticipation of, a, of an uncertain election season, they're gonna pre run? Or is this gonna be a situation where they wait to see who ends up winning and then make those decisions? I think they're already doing it. And I'm gonna pull, a, pull up a chart. <laughs> you think they're, gonna, they're already doing it mm -hmm. to avoid tariffs next year? I think they're just doing, I think that, it's China. I think China has already figured out a way through. This, la, this chart that I have here, and Noy Mahoney did a great job of writing an article just this week. This is our inbound ocean tea use volume index for imports from China to Mexico. It's up 40% <laughs> last year on our, our index. This is booking volumes. Now, uh, Noi wrote about 60% from Zanetta database standpoint. This, they're, they're already pulling stuff in around the tariffs. Now, this is different than the 2019 trade war in the way that that trade war, yeah. everything came in through California. 18, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 18, 19. Now yeah. things are, not all of it, mind you, this is still... You know, this has got a lot of upside potential still. So your mm -hmm. thesis is that, mm -hmm. and Noise, I think, backs this up, mm -hmm. is that a lot of those Chinese mm -hmm. manufacturers or even U.S. retailers, mm -hmm. U.S. importers, yep. are moving freight into China, into Mexico, mm -hmm. from China, so that these can become Mexican products, when in reality, they're just Chinese products with a Mexican label on them. Exactly. Now, that, that's exactly what the Zanetta analyst said, was he couldn't prove it definitively. Because they, they're, they've done this long enough to yeah. <laughs> not want you to be able to prove it. Exactly. Nobody wants to get fined yeah. uh, or have their products uh, seized because they're avoiding tariff yeah. or avoiding, you know, so. And, and, and to that point, like we've talked about nearshoring. Like everybody knows about nearshoring, Mexico's growth, boom, like they're investing lots of industrial yeah. money along the border there. This is on top of all that. <laughs> can I can I challenge this a bit? Absolutely. I believe it, but mm -hmm. I want to say a thesis could be that if you're rebuilding manufacturing in Mexico, mm -hmm. you still need the raw materials and the components to go into those products. For sure. So, so if you build your final assembly in Mexico, I'm still getting sourcing products from China. Mm -hmm. Some of that is in that data. Absolutely. Oh, 100%. But, but mm -hmm. I actually think completely. We saw this in Vietnam. Yeah. In, mm -hmm. as, Viet, as what happened back in 2018, 19, mm -hmm when Trump put the, the initial tariffs on, Vietnam activity exploded. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those products were nothing more than China to Vietnam set in a, a distribution center and, and <laughs> loaded from one container to another. Right. 
that's all it was, mm -hmm. uh, with a whole new fresh bill of laden and off you go. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting concept. I'm glad you had this chart, by the way. This is from Sonar's bookings data. Yep, IoT. I think it's a pretty powerful story. I'm glad you brought this chart. This, yeah. is, a, this is a really good chart. <laughs> this is actually my, my bonus chart that I, I threw in at the last I'm glad thing. you did, because yeah. <laughs> I think it's telling, like, a lot of people have been talking yeah. about this and speculating, mm -hmm. but I think it's a really important story because it actually proves exactly what you've mm -hmm. said is that Mexico is benefiting greatly from China. Yeah. Uh, and what's what's happening with the geopolitical pressures on China. Do you think that this is going to, like, you know, the traditional flow through a freight, especially consumer goods, has come through the ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, the West Coast. We were talking about kind of a retraction from the East Coast because of mm -hmm. the Red Sea stuff. Well, yeah, Panama Canal. And Panama Canal. Yeah. Um, do you think this will actually soften some of that West Coast? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, Market share wise, I think fundamentally the West, the China to the West Coast mm -hmm. as a market share mm -hmm. is largely probably has been at its peak. I think what we're seeing now is more displacement and fragmentation across the global economy mm -hmm. where we're, we're not, we're unlikely to see a single country the way China has played that role for the past 20 years, play in terms of global domination of trade. Right. I think potentially Mexico and the United States, and you'll have trading partners that you're largely dependent upon for mm -hmm. certain commodities or certain trade. I think as it, as, it, as it goes in terms of market share to the US, Mexico will take China's place over time. I mean, it has. But it already has in terms but, of value. But it will continue to erode that market share. But I, I think globally, um, I think trade would just be much more fragmented. Okay. Do you think that that means that we're also going to see other emerging trading partners? Colombia is one that yeah. I'm pretty bullish on. I think Colombia, because it's a stable country, which is... <laughs> which is crazy to I, say. I was, <laughs> I was once married to a yeah. Colombian. I yeah. went to Colombia in 2004, and people were like, don't go. Yeah. Like, you're going to get, you know, like, you're not welcome down right. there. And <laughs> I, uh, that wasn't true at all. I felt very safe. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the reality is, like, I think Colombia will benefit um, I think it's Mexico, it's Colombia, it's Canada, uh, I think do quite well. Yeah, I want to pull up one more chart before we get into some Q&A here. The IOTI, which is what you just saw, but at a very lane level, granular level. I was going to go the other direction, but since you brought it up, it made sense. Uh, the IOTI, of course, measures the 20-foot equivalent bookings. And I feel like I use this chart specifically for a little bit of a forward-looking indicator into what do we expect from a spring season. Now, we just had, you see this huge peak, the white peak is the current year, similar to that of like that pandemic era. <laughs> uh, and then it plummeted. It's pretty interesting how strong the, the last year, you know, one of the unwritten stories yeah. or discussed stories, just how robust sort of last year ended yeah. and, and how strong it was this year. Th this feels like a little bit of a pull forward situation in front of Lunar New Year because it was so high. And yep. the rebound, we're still rebounding somewhat, but it slowed down here in the last uh, few days. Do you have any thoughts around- I think this what this tells us, it's interesting because what what is interesting about the ocean market and trucking market is mm -hmm. trucking is far more responsive to near-term shocks and demand, sure. either good or bad. Like mm -hmm. you see it in the trucking data almost immediately. Mm -hmm. You don't see it in the ocean data for a while. Right. It's a pretty significant lag. Oh, yeah. It took them like, what, four or five months well, to we, respond? Well, we reported in March 30, yeah. you know, it was last March when we mm -hmm. saw it in track. started in January, but certainly in March is mm -hmm. when we, we first reported it in 22, two years ago. And it was June when we came out with our ocean report, but mm -hmm. it was still peaking. Yeah. And it wasn't until, I think, October before everybody, everybody's like, wait. Before everybody said, yeah. wait a second, we have a problem. So it was a six-month yeah. lead. But what's interesting about the ocean market is that the trucking market is going to respond fast. Mm -hmm. The yeah. ocean market has a pretty significant lag because products are ordered, they're assembled, they're manufactured, they're sent over. Mm -hmm. Those orders are continue to flow even after retailers have sort of stopped ordering or right. importing. What's interesting about this is that this tells us, and the way I read this is that, that retailers are actually pretty bullish about the state of the consumer. Mm -hmm because of the high volumes. And right. so it suggests to me that they feel pretty confident to take on these imports. And what it also tells us is that the stuff is going into warehouses mm -hmm. and distribution centers 
And eventually it will end up coming back into the freight economy, the domestic freight economy, because it has to. It's not going to sit in warehouses forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, uh, I think it's a bullish sign for trucking. Okay. I tend to agree. And it looks like we're still trending. I mean, obviously year over year gains. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. look, it's strong, much stronger than the, the baby blue. It's yeah. about to hit Baylor, baby. <laughs> Sick them bears. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to leave time for Q&A. So I'll go ahead and toss it back over to Marianne much as always for the discussion. Lots of questions already have come through, so we will go ahead and dive into those. But if you've not already submitted your questions, you can do so through the Q&A box in your console. First question for you guys. Given the current state affairs globally in the container shipping markets and channels, should we expect more volume to be moved via air freight or will there continue to be delays via the sea? And have U.S. imports still slowed as of recent with Mexico imports leading the way? This is the second time I've been asked this question this week. I don't know if you've been asked. I, I have. I, Kulich, Eric Kulich just wrote a wonderful piece. So tell us this. your... He, well, he basically stated that the air cargo market is absolutely having a recovery session, just like every other, you know, one that we've talked about in terms of a year-over-year -year progression. Yep. I, I think there was, you know, that market's still not necessarily all the way back, but I, I you know, the Red Sea and all the in international stuff has a propping, I think you're still, like that's still kind of like a sense of urgency thing mm -hmm. that people may like, I just don't trust that long-term. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a near-term thing that people respond to. Yeah, I, it was interesting because mm -hmm. this question was asked to me yeah. Yeah, uh, earlier this week, and I thought a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I think, if you sort of go back to COVID, what we saw was, was there was no lift of all. Like, right. People are just trying to get products. There's super high demand, hyper demand, unexpected. Components mm -hmm. for raw materials uh, and products were just, people paid anything to move product. Mm -hmm. That is not how the market's working today. No. Maybe the exception of like a, a semiconductors and some of the stuff from some right. of these AI processing high value technologies, stuff. high value, which has always been air freight sensitive. Right. Uh, and those are doing really well, sort of driving some of that excess in the air freight market. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're seeing a situation where ship, shipping, global shipping is being, people are moving freight into, mm -hmm. um, from containers into air freight uh, to get lift, except when on ex sort of certain cases. So I don't think that's driving demand. I think what's driving demand in air freight is largely the commodities that you would expect, semiconductors, highly correlated to, air freight prices are highly correlated to semiconductor demand. I think that's driving it. Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's also we should be talking about at some point is Boeing's problems. Oh, yeah. In terms of mm -hmm. what that means for just air, uh, airline capacity mm -hmm. and therefore what that means long term good point. in terms of, of the just availability of lift. Because at some point that will have a factor that, you know, when you start losing passenger lift capacity to, to Boeing's problems, um, that could play out in terms of, you know, the airlines, I don't know if you caught this, you probably haven't because you don't study the air market that much. Not like you do. But the, uh, <laughs> the airlines have, have actually stopped hiring or have oh, eased yeah, off yeah. a lot of their aggressive hiring practices. Okay. I mean, it was six months ago when United mm -hmm. was doing advertisements on college football about their aviation academy. First time I'd ever seen that. The airlines are, are largely full at this point in terms of pilots because they can't get right. airplanes to, to fly. And, and so that, at some point, is going to have some impact on it. A lot of it's domestic, mm -hmm. but you'll see it in the international markets as well. There. All right, next question. Uh, it says, can you discuss the outlook on domestic versus international intermodal performance and what's driving that divergence? And what will that mean for intermodal moving forward? Intermodal is doing relatively well. I mean, intermodal is a, a market. A lot of it is that import activity that you've seen that's driving it. Well, our um, last chart, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that it tends to be the, 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 the sort of nuts and bolts of intermodal is largely related to international container markets. Even when you're talking about points that aren't near ports necessarily or near the ocean ports where you see intermodal, a lot of those products are actually coming off of containers that have been imported. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, but intermodal is, is, uh, is holding up strong and I, I, think, I think it will continue to be strong. It will put, pre at some point, they will run out of chassis, as they always do. And mm -hmm. when they do, that will put pressure on trucking and demand. Yeah, I think, too, I was talking to Mike bowden Distel recently. And, you know, domestic still is up against a very soft trucking environment. Um, it's going to cap it. 
like they can't drop prices much lower than they already have. Uh, we saw Knight Swift, their intermodal sector uh, kind of suffered there late uh, last year. And it's, you know, it's one of those situations where they almost need the trucking market to turn to really support that side of the equation. The international, like we just talked about, like that looks <laughs> really good yep. uh, from that component. But the domestic side has got some pretty heavy competition level with it. Well, I mean, as long as trucking rates are yeah. low, that's going to do it. But that's just a fundamental of a short term yeah. issue. I think that works itself out. It will eventually. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. It says, can you discuss why the outbound tender rejection index is so low? Is this more regionally specific? I mean, there are certainly regional anomalies that you end up in the data, but uh, the tender rejection data is so low because frankly, there's too much capacity out there. Yeah. And what this, when you see a low rejection rate, what it basically is telling you is that carriers um, don't have options. Like they have almost, they're basically taking you know, 97 or 96 and a half percent of the freight that they're offered, they're taking um, 96.21. <laughs> yeah. um, they're taking almost every load that they're offered and uh, on a national basis. There are certainly uh, certain markets which have higher rejection rates, but it, as a general rule, there's excess capacity, even when you end up in certain markets. I mean, the, the thing about trucking capacity is there is a large percent of the capacity that when markets are incredibly soft, they're nomadic. They will move and shift those trucks to markets that do have demand. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is the markets that have high rejection rates will start to come down because the, basically you're moving capacity into another market. Mm -hmm. and, and that just creates a situation where there's now less rejections than were before. Yeah, I mean, uh, traditionally speaking, you're talking about anything about that's under five ish percent is a very soft deflationary market where there is more truck availability than there is demand for them. Yeah. Uh, I think we've talked about, you know, I think f somewhere between that five and a half to seven percent. I like range. to see eight percent. Yeah. It's been the number that I, I've always felt like we're in a more of a bold, but it's, it's more of a, balance. again, it's all about relative. Yeah. Like we've talked about this before is like the actual number isn't that important. I mean, right. we're looking at 3.79 percent is soft. But if I told you last May it was at 2.5%, you may feel a little different. I mean, that's like 50% higher. Right. The, the reality is that like when you're in a, a market where you're 3.79%, it's still very loose. It's still very soft. Um, I would, I want to see it come up and that's when it tells me we have a little more confidence. When we sustain at like a five-ish range for a while, that tells me that we're, we're closer to equilibrium. You know, we're, get, we're getting good, yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think we're on our way there. I think it's going to, I mean, I think Easter, the post-Easter Part of the market will be a really I'm looking at May. Market. I'm looking at you, Memorial Day. <laughs> and it says, what are your thoughts on why the decline of carrier authorities continues to stall in March? You know, Zach may have a different take on this. I, I think a lot of this is these are her authority registrations yeah. for the most part. And I think one of the things that we didn't talk about is because you've gone to the data, I haven't. But one of the things that I would expect is that carriers that Guys that have worked for a carrier and they've been frustrated because they're not getting freight very well could be starting their own carrier and starting it up. So like it's her authorities, it's not net, net trucks. And I think some of that is just the churn in, in the industry that's also causing some of these factors. Yeah, I think too, we've seen net revocations come down. If you were looking at net revocations like you did prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. you wouldn't really have a good picture of what was really happening. Uh, we're looking at net changes in our, in our data that we showed you here today. And that's telling me, um, you know, one, one part of that component is the net revocations and the revocations are running through. We did another little background study, roughly 61% of everybody that's exited the market since September has had less than three years experience. Mm. So there's a lot of operators that came in COVID peak times because three years ago was 2021 now. Yeah. <laughs> and that was right in the middle of the pandemic. And you're talking about people that bought trucks at you know, five, six X their value that has been completely washed out and eroded. So I think we're coming to a point where those, those exits are slowing down because there was just, you know, there's only so much. The really small guys are churning out, yeah. have churned in yeah. other words. And then what you're end up in a situation is now we want to see some of those larger guys churn. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this a few times. But the level of bankruptcy stories, I know it's, it's an anecdotal right. sort of you know, it's not a scientific thing, 
But the number of stories we do around sizable bankruptcies just hasn't hit 2019 levels. No. And it just tells me that there's still, we still have more to come. Yeah, I, I, think, I think too that was biased towards the, you saw a lot more mid market kind of. A lot more mid market. Mid market. And we figures. haven't seen a ton of those. And the smaller ones don't necessarily get. Well, them. there's no article on yeah. a guy with one truck. Exactly. Like, unfortunately for him, like, maybe fortunate for them. Also, consolidation. Them. Consolidation has certainly been a factor, but I think a lot of it is that the mid-market players have not, we've not seen a, a sort of wholesale reduction in capacity of the mid-market yeah. that you would, that I would have expected. Right, for sure. All right, next question. It says, how does the current outbound tender volume index reflect the dynamics of inbound shipping markets in the U.S., considering factors such as changing consumer demand, supply chain disruptions, and the influence of global trade patterns on shipping lane preference? I always... Sorry, sorry, Mary, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I always like the Laredo market yeah. is a really interesting sort of market. Do you have this chart, by the way? I don't. I, I actually showed it earlier this morning to somebody, but I should have put it I just it think what's down. happening with, on a market share basis in Laredo is that, is that, is that nearshoring story. Oh, it's... Hilarious. And I think that is where you see on terms of freight that, that is on an outbound basis is so much is happening in Texas in terms of freight concentration. Mm -hmm. I remember when Texas was a territory of me as a sales guy 25 years ago or 20 years ago, whenever it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Texas was a, you know, it, it was a it was a backhaul market. Yep. Like trucks went in there, but they didn't leave. There was nothing, very little uncle being produced there. Yep. And what's happened is the rise of the distribution centers and sort of the reemergence of Mexico as a major trade lane has really shifted into a, a you know, what the role that California used to play in mm -hmm. freight and trucking when I was in the industry, 20 something years ago, mm -hmm. Texas is, is starting to reposition itself as that market where if you can get to Texas, you can get freight out of it, mm -hmm. um, much more so than, than what it has been. Oh, about. it's not prone to the same level of disruption that the yeah. California area is. And uh, a lot of that is just because of the locate, geographical yeah. location oh, yeah. of being right oh, in the center of the country. Absolutely ideal in terms yeah. of the current supply. And then, you, then you have oil and gas in Houston that drives an enormous amount of, whether it's Oil and gas related or petrochemical related, you have a lot of that activity. And the Port of Houston yeah. is also benefiting from some of the, the gain shares. Not, and this is beyond Mexico, but the Port of Houston oh, yeah. is also winning. Oh, well, the Port of Houston has grown way more than the national average of bookings data. I actually looked at this chart this morning too. Uh, Port Houston still retaining, even though I know we saw this kind of pull back into the West Coast. Or Houston's still beating the market. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of look at IOTI as kind of like my S&P 500 for uh, the market. And Houston is, I think, about 20% higher still. And they're in the, you know, they're in a very large mm -hmm. capital campaign to expand that port to yeah. dredge it. And so I think Houston, you should be quite bullish on Texas for oh, so I'm many different reasons. Extremely bullish on Texas. And Laredo, like you said, is the second largest growth market in the United States, right behind Phoenix. And Phoenix, of course, is getting some of that California uh, benefit as yeah. obviously people are pulling well, some of that freight out of Well, there's fewer it. warehouses in California that can that have capacity. I mean, a ton of warehouses. Warehouses don't have a lot of capacity. An overflow it. facility. You can't build it. Cheaper. Yeah, you got to exactly. build it in Phoenix. And, and Phoenix is certainly better. And that. to answer his question from the inbound standpoint, there has not been a significant shift. Outbound, we just talked about the biggest two. Inbound, I haven't seen. It's where do people live? <laughs> yeah, it's the Northeast and, you know, Chicago and obviously some of the, you know, Atlanta, the bigger consumer markets in the United States. The Sun Belt has been a, is largely an they're, I mean, they're Florida is still a backwater when it comes to the Northwest is still a place that nobody wants origins. to. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the Northeast, nobody wants to go up there to put a truck up there nope. because it's congested and it's hard to get freight out. And Florida is still a, a you know, a backhaul state that you can't get freight out of. Yeah, the Northeast had a- Arizona is an interesting one though, because you did, like- it, That's true. It was used to be a really painful backhaul state. Well, now it's getting a bunch of that freight coming it, in it's, from it's California. It's all getting in from California. The Drake people. carriers are taking it into Phoenix mm -hmm. and then becomes a, a distribution center. Yeah, Phoenix, I guess, would be the exception to that rule. Phoenix has actually grown inbound. <laughs> Significantly. And outbound. So. And outbound, yeah. All right, next question. It says, what is driving the view that the positive inflection in the freight markets will occur in the second half of this year and not sooner? And what might cause that to happen earlier or be delayed? I don't have any data that's telling us that there's going to be an inflection in the second half, the second quarter. Like there's nothing in the data that's telling me like, and look, 
the data that we have is high frequency, so it tends to actually be, before the broader market fills it, it tends to be about a quarter ahead. Mm -hmm. Like we've made some early calls simply based on reading the data. And so there's nothing in the data that's saying that there's any reason why the second quarter will have more robust activity. I mean, you got the spread data, which you're talking about right here. We saw it get closer to that 50 cent mark, and then it I, I, I mean, this isn't as clean of a view, but we can pull this one up here, the, the contract rate and spot rate chart. I didn't show this a little bit ago, but I've actually used this chart as a little bit of a mathematical reason when you're just doing some basic trend line analysis. If you look at the white line there, the contract rate curve suggests as does the spot market curve, which I don't put as much stock into doing this exercise into, uh, but they both suggest that we are curving, we are going, we are actually curving into where they will be higher at the, the end bottom. of the year. The double bottom, maybe it's, triple bottom on this that. This is just chart technical analysis. Technical analysis. You've got a couple of double, triple yeah. bottoms happening <laughs> on these charts. There's no real fundamental backing to this is just looking at a trend line analysis purely if things remain in the condition they are this is telling you something about the market though it is telling you that there is maybe capacity hasn't fully you know cleared out to the point of equilibrium yet but we're moving and everybody is expecting that from a rate side environment as well yeah but i don't think it's going to happen second quarter no, not second quarter, second half. Well, the question was, give us a reason why we could. Oh, yeah. The, if you looked at this. There's trend nothing line. in the data that says okay. there's nothing in the second quarter. All right. We'll take time for one more quick one. Um, it says, what could or would happen if the government stimulus was pulled? What would be the longer term implications of not replacing old infrastructure? That's a great question. I actually heard people who study this a lot more than I do. And um, but one of the, the big uh, uh, funds on Wall Street, uh, they had an economist, um, and he was the one that pointed out that a lot of what's driving the economy is this money. I mean, mm -hmm. like at some point, those bills do stop. Right. Like there, there is no more continuation of these bills. Mm -hmm. And when they do stop, when the appropriations and the funding, the amount of money stops, is that there will be a significant pullback in the economy. Um, and his prediction that that would take place in uh, 25, 26 is something to watch out for. Um, so, yeah, it's a risk. I mean, if, if we truly believe that the government stimulus is driving it and you have a lot of questions about whether that would continue, and it, we're unlikely to see either administration, or at least certainly uh, the Republicans, allow for more government stimulus at right. least as long as Biden's in office, then I, I don't think there's a case to be bullish on government stimulus. They can't even get a balanced budget uh, through Congress. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one with you because I'm not going to even pretend to know what they're doing up there. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks so much. That is all of the time that we have for today. So Craig and Zach, thanks as always for being here to share your insights with us. We also appreciate you, our audience, for participating and asking so many great questions. Apologies that we weren't able to get to them all. For those of you who have attended a Freight Waves event before, and even more importantly, if you have not, just a reminder that our Future of Supply Chain event will be taking place June 4th and 5th in Atlanta. If you've not, you have not been to a Freight and Logistics event until you've been to a Freight Waves event, I can promise you that. We have a March Madness Flash sale running through March 29th, where you can save $900 per ticket. To purchase yours today, visit live.freightwaves.com. And finally, just a quick reminder that our State of Freight webinar series will continue on April 18th. So mark your calendars and keep an eye out for your invite to join us again next month. Thanks so much for joining everyone.